Hi, this is Gareth Stack of the podcast and vidcast Technolytics. What follows is an interview with Sue Sherman, Executive Director of the British Digital Rights Group, the Open Rights Group. Well, the Open Rights Group is a new digital rights organisation that was started in July last year by luminaries such as Danny O'Brien and Cory Doctorow from the EFF. Um, we basically started because we felt there wasn't an organisation in the UK that had a, a broad remit when it came to, came to digital rights issues. So we've got a lot of single issue groups, so no to ID, obviously looking at ID cards, um, the FFII did a lot of really good work around software payments. There was no one taking um, an overview of, of everything that's going on. And equally there's no real grassroots organisations. So we decided that um, our remit is as broad as possible. Um, we have deliberately decided that it's digital rights, meaning um, wherever civil liberties are impacted by digital technologies, so that if something ugly comes up that we couldn't have foreseen, our remit is wide enough to allow us to address it. Um, our main aims are to raise awareness of digital rights issues um, amongst the public and the press. Um, there's a historically been a bit of an issue with reporting in the media about these kinds of problems, these issues, because the journalists don't necessarily understand the problems, and those who do don't necessarily have access to the experts they need in order to get a counterbalance to the standard industry or government lines. Um, so we do a lot of uh, putting journalists in touch with experts and um, providing another point of view, um, hopefully to encourage more balanced reporting um, and, and to just get the, uh, the minority side of the, the argument heard. Um, we're also very uh, keen and, and it's very important for us that we develop a volunteer base and start doing grassroots campaigning um, because there's a lot of people who are really um, exercised about these issues. And they, at the moment, um, were until the Open Rights Group, didn't really have anywhere to go. Um, they didn't have anywhere to go meet each other, um, to uh, campaign. There was no one running that kind of um, effort in the way that, say, the EFF does in the States. So um, those were the reasons behind um, the Open Rights Group and, and uh, what we're trying to achieve. And uh, so far, things are going fairly well, I think. Great stuff. So you mentioned setting up kind of voluntary efforts and communicating with um, industry and the media and so on. Uh, what do you think are the, the most important issues that uh, the Open Rights Group are currently kind of dealing with or trying to get information out about right now for digital rights? Um, we spent quite a bit of time before Christmas um, working on data retention, um, which was a directive that was pushed through the European Parliament to force ISPs and telecoms companies to uh, retain traffic data, so that's information about your mobile phone calls and your web surfing habits and your email. Um, we did quite a lot of work with um, Privacy International on that and um, also liaised with European Digital Rights. Um, they had people actually in the Parliament um, on the ground feeding information out and we were able to get uh, quite a lot of press coverage for those issues. Um, there are some other issues that are, are coming up now, such as the National Vehicle Tracking Database, um, which is a, a database which uses automatic number plate recognition software to uh, track vehicle movements, every vehicle on the roads, essentially. Um, that's an issue we need to look at. There are other sort of privacy issues, um, such as children's privacy, and obviously we'll be working with Know2ID as um, the ID cards uh, campaign gains momentum. Um, yeah, there's an awful lot going on at the moment, so it's it's difficult to um, sometimes to decide what you have resources to do and what you don't have resources to do. So um, on a, a IP level, um, there's the Gowers review, um, which is a, a Treasury level review into intellectual property which we've been invited to take part in because we took part in a, a parliamentary inquiry into digital rights management um, earlier in the year. So again, trying to get involved in this kind of uh, parliamentary um, review process and, and try and get our points across that um, 
regarding copyright and intellectual property. So these are a lot of the same issues that have been addressed in the past, but um, this review is a kind of like overarching um, review that, that you know, we're hoping to be able to represent groups that otherwise wouldn't have a voice. So speaking of uh, intellectual property and potential for a form of intellectual property law, there's a whole spectrum on the sort of copyleft side or um, sort of technorati side or, uh, of, uh, of opinion between those who believe that any kind of prosecutions for say file sharing are completely wrong and are violating um, individual human rights where it's a, it's a civil matter of property that shouldn't be criminalised and those who believe that while copyleft and creative commons and things like that are a great idea um, essentially file sharing is completely wrong and so on. Where uh, on, upon that continuum do, um, do the open rights group fall? Um, it's a really complicated issue, copyright in a sense, because there are many problems with copyright law that is, it's not necessarily a should they, shouldn't they be um, uh, prosecuting. Um, the letter of the law says that file sharing is illegal. Um, the review goes deeper than whether that's, that's right or wrong and goes into the heart of our copyright regime is incapable of dealing with modern technology. So we have um, the ability to do things that our law never was designed to deal with. Um, there are also, there's become this big disparity between what people think is legal and what is actually legal. So for example, um, there is no right to a private copy in the UK. In other countries in Europe there is a right, but in the UK there isn't. Yet most people genuinely believe when they make a copy of their CD to play on their iPod, they think that's legal, they think that's a reasonable behaviour. So you have this gulf, this discrepancy between behaviours that are seen as normal and acceptable and what the law actually says is acceptable. And then there's an even wider gulf between for a minority of people who um, believe that you know, they should be able to fa uh, share music with their friends and the law is that there's an even bigger gap. Um, I think the problems are twofold. Firstly, the law is out of date and it needs some really serious reform. We need to take into account modern technologies, um, modern expectations and modern needs. Um, but secondly, the creative industries, the music industry and the movie industry, are in many ways attempting to legislate failing business models uh, into the future. So they're, uh, they're having problems earning enough money. So instead of looking at their business model and going, actually, you know, things have changed, things have moved on, we need to change, we need a new way of um, delivering our products to the fans, um, let's have a look at the technologies that have come up and you know, really make the best of it. Instead of taking that forward thinking and imaginative route, they're basically going, we have to protect our existing business model, we will do this through litigation and legislation. So, there's really, you know, those are the sort of two aspects. We need to reform copyright law across the board, but you know, we also need to try and push back at the creative industries and say, look, actually, this isn't a threat to you, this is an opportunity. Suddenly you have these tools where you can uh, distribute your content to you know, millions of people really, really easily, instantaneously, and on, uh, for a very, very small budget. You should be making this stuff available because, as you know, the public, we would rather buy stuff legitimately than have to go through some grotty little peer-to-peer -peer file sharing network that maybe we don't even entirely understand what the risks are in terms of you know, downloading um, you know, malware or spyware and uh, you know, falling foul of, of the more nefarious citizens of the internet. So. Um, from that point of view, you know, there's, there are two opportunities here and we have to make sure we grasp both of them. So what would you say to those, kind of, from an industry perspective, creative uh, media industries and distribution industries, who say that to not pursue um, with litigation kind of, uh, uh, copyright infringement is to almost kind of um, 
led away with theft or to uh, to at least kind of a, a, to uh, to not defend copyright and, and to weaken copyright in the case of individual properties, but to actually kind of um, encourage theft and that to say that they should expand their business models is almost kind of saying that they should become t-shirt salesmen or, or whatever, you know, merchant, merchant salesmen rather than um, producing or creating new content. Um, I think there's a, a major assumption at the heart of the prosecution of file sharers and that assumption is that every file that's being shared is a sale that's being lost. That has no basis in reality whatsoever. Um, one of the best studies done of file sharing and sales was by Felix Oberholzer and Coleman Strumpf from Harvard Business School. They took three months worth of peer-to-peer -peer data, three months worth of sales data, married that data together, analysed it, and came to the conclusion that they couldn't see any significant impact on sales by file sharing. Under certain circumstances, for the most popular songs, there was actually a slight positive increase in sales because of file sharing. So they're looking at um, raw data and coming to conclusions that file sharing is not having an impact on the industry. The industry, dis you know, their response to that was, we have these surveys that show, but surveying people about illegal behaviours is notoriously unreliable way to get data. Um, people have a tendency to not be entirely truthful when they talk about um, what they're doing. And it's very, very easy to, the way that you phrase your questions, the way that you select your sample, the size of your sample, all of these can go to creating uh, data that doesn't really hold up to scrutiny. But the industry is determined that, you know, this is true, that every lost every file shared is a, a lost sale. Um, so I think, you know, it's very difficult to explain to them that um, by taking people to court, they're not going to actually have the impact that they want to have. If you look at what's happened in the States, um, they've done an awful lot of litigation hasn't actually damaged or dented the amount of file sharing going on. Um, just recently I, I saw figures that indicated that the you know, file sharing has increased, but you know their sales have had kind of picked up a bit as well. Um, so what you I personally believe that file sharing has been made a scapegoat. Because there's an awful lot else going on in the creative industries. You know, they're releasing fewer CDs. They're physically creating less product. They're shipping less CDs. So if sales numbers are down, exactly which sales numbers are we talking about? Are we talking percentage? Are we talking absolute numbers? Um, you know, there's all sorts of holes in their argument. But I think you know, they're reacting in a knee-jerk way. And instead of kind of like saying, OK, you know what? There's you know, a whole vast sea of fans here that we can put material in front of, they'll learn to love it, if they love it, they'll buy it. Because as we are human, we are acquisitive, we like to have things in front of us to, to hold and to feel and to look at. And um, there have been studies done that show that the um, people with the largest MP3 collections are also the people who spend the most on buying CDs. So there's a, a number of assumptions that I think are flawed and by having a more open sharing culture, I think you will end up with a more vibrant and commercially viable creative industry. And the proof of that, you only have to look at the Creative Commons license works. Um, for example, Cory Doctorow, who's um, a just fabulous activist, also on the Open Rights Group Advisory Council, has released virtually everything that he's written, you know, all of his novels and short stories all come out under Creative Commons licences. Now he, his first novel is the most downloaded novel ever, as far as I'm aware. But it's on its like sixth print run. His publishers are very happy with um, the sales of, of his book. Even though I could go down and I could download that book now, print out a copy, read the whole thing, never have to pay Corey's cent for it. Yet, 
people want to buy things because they want the physical item and they also want that kind of like nice warm glow of knowing that you know, a small percentage of the money that I've just spent on this book goes to Corey directly. Yeah, you know, I've paid for at least a whole cup of tea. So um, the lack of trust of the consumer by the industry um, is what's driving people to um, break the law. Um, and there, there are many examples um, of, of you know, evidence that these assumptions are flawed and evidence that um, you can be open, you can share and still have a viable business model. Okay. Um, thanks very much for that very, very detailed answer. <laughs> <laughs> on a slightly lighter note, um, there's an interesting story which is going to do the raise sometimes mentioned on the Open Words blog about uh, the kind of over enthusiastic enforcement of copyright law in the case of the Firefox uh, distribution. Could you give us a little bit of information about, about that and um, maybe what it, what it says about how content is viewed and uh, copyright and so on by the authorities, so to speak? Well, the, the, the long short of it, as I understand, is. Um a trading standards officer of course, discovered a company uh, selling CDs which had Firefox on. They ring uh, Firefox, and the Mozilla Foundation, and kind of go, oh, this is dreadful, you know, someone's uh, distributing your software, and they kind of went, yeah, <laughs> that's good. Um, and the trading standards officer got terribly wound up about this and, and, and basically said, uh, how can we possibly be expected to fight piracy if you give your software away for nothing? Um, and again, you know, this is just showing a, just a level of ignorance about how these things work. Everything that's created does not necessarily need an owner who controls the way that it's distributed and uh, who can use it and who can buy it and sell it. It is entirely possible to create very valuable works, whether they're um, software, works of art, music, film, whatever, and give it away. And this seems to be kind of like, oh, you know, this is a concept we have a hard time with. You're actually giving stuff away for nothing? Are you mad? And I think this is a, a, a reflection of a society which is um, a permission society and a property-based society. This is viewing all human endeavour as belonging to someone. And if it belongs to someone, that means it has value. If it has value, that value should be recouped. And that value should be controlled. So if you own something, you must want to control who else uses it, which means I must, perforce, have to ask permission to do anything with it. And this is where the open source community um, has a really valuable part to play in educating the, the wider populace about the values of giving stuff away for nothing and collaborating on things. This is where Creative Commons comes in. And there are something like 53 million Creative Commons licensed works now. Um, if you look at Flickr, Flickr has something like, um, really bad with numbers, I think it's 40 million images on Flickr now. Uh, Getty Images, they've got uh, one million. And eight million of the images on Flickr are released under a Creative Commons license. Figures are something like that. So, um, there's a large group of people who believe that giving stuff away is valuable. Who believe that it's perfectly okay for you to come along, take my image and the, my photograph that I've taken and do creative stuff with it yourself. People who are releasing um, you know, poetry, music, um, text works, all sorts of things under licenses that allow you to, to go away and do whatever you want with it. And I think this is a, a fundamental part of human nature is to share. And this is where the, the small minority of people who um, have been in charge of our content for the last hundred years have a real problem with this because they perceive us as passive consumers of content. And we are slowly proving to them that there's no such thing, really. All of us, one way or another, are active creators of content. It's just that the media has been telling us for so long that um, amateur content, 
is subpar, substandard, of no value. And we're suddenly discovering, actually, my pictures of Prague are of value. They're of value to me, my friends, my family. And that content is, in fact, more valuable. It's irreplaceable. You know, your, um, the gig that, you know, your first ever gig with your band, footage of that is irreplaceable. I can go and buy Shrek as many times as I like. You know, I can lose the DVD, give it to someone else, stand on it, break it, whatever. You know, it will always be there for me to buy. But the first Christmas I have with my boyfriend, that's photographs I'm never going to replace. Um, you know, my niece's first steps, you know, that's imagery that just can't be replicated. And so, you know, there's this shift in public awareness about what's valuable, what's not valuable, and I think this, this causes the media an awful lot of uh, concern that the creative industry is sitting there going, oh my god, you know, there's all this stuff people are making and they're not buying our stuff. Which is, of course, rubbish. But, um, you know, it, it's a shift in perception that um, is being made very, very evident at the moment because of the technology that we're using to interact with each other. It's, good. it's very interesting to me, I haven't really thought about it before, but in a way it's a return to the pre-mass media days of people kind of making their own entertainment, only now they can use these new distribution channels to, to share that. Absolutely. Um, just getting back to kind of your wider remit, as a take-home message, um, winding our way out, um, would, would you have anything kind of um, to say to people who want to kind of get involved in defending digital rights or to, even to learn more about it? Absolutely. Um, the big message to anybody who wants to get involved is get involved. <laughs> um, openrightsgroup.org, come along, have a look at the blog. Um, we have discussion lists, we have a wiki. Uh, it's very, very easy to get involved. Um, if you're in Ireland, then support Digital Rights Ireland. If you're in the US, support the EFF. Um, find your local group and, and just get involved. Even if all you're doing is um, having a bit of a chat on the discussion list, um, it doesn't necessarily have to be financial support. Although, obviously, we like financial support very much indeed. Um, it really just be aware. Be aware of what's going on, keep up to date with the issues, and talk to people, tell your friends, tell your family. So um, if you have an understanding, say, of data retention, and the way that data retention turn basically turns your mobile phone into a little government tracking beacon, tell people about it, you blog about it, contact your MP, tell them that you're really not happy with this state of affairs, you don't like this legislation, make your feelings known. Um, because you know, there's, there's no point sitting there being you know, quietly annoyed about it. You know, participate, that's the main message. Thank you very much. Thank you.